trust. You want to yeah. build trust in the in the marketplace, in the community. Oh, and I'll tell you what's happening out west too. I heard, which is this is what I mean by bad actors. There are people that are, that have been, you know, they've been growing a lot longer than we have here in New York on the east and the east coast in general. But there are people that invested a lot of time and a lot of money into growing correctly and doing the right thing. And supposedly now, there are adjacent farmers or adjacent property owners, I don't want to say farmers, adjacent property owners that are going up to these established farmers and saying, listen, I need you to buy my crop of such and such, or I need you to pay me X number of dollars, or I'm going to grow male plants and ruin your crop. So they're attempting, and I don't know how successful they are and if it's you know been stopped now that it came to light, but they're attempting to extort those farmers and those honorable growers by threatening to pollute their plants. I mean, that's crazy. And that's what I mean. That's really an example of a bad actor. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's nuts. Yeah, exactly. That was my, I had the same reaction when I heard that. <laughs> Never would have thought about that. I mean, I guess at this point in time, yeah, since it is a, a, a regulated industry and you do have to get licensing to grow it, um, that would, seems like that would have to be a, a governmental ruling on like, you'd have to put standards in place, right? Uh, but uh, it's just, oof, that's just, that's, that's dirty playing. <laughs> it's just not, yeah, that's oh. really dirty cool, you know? Yeah. And but, but that goes on. And I guess that's, you know, that's enterprising people is good, yeah. good and bad enterprising people. And that's pretty creative. Yeah. But not in a good way. Absolutely. Everybody finds their niche. <laughs> exactly oh wow yeah yeah no there's definitely a lot of and there's a, there's a lot of complications for sure i mean not even necessarily just the the legal aspects but as you said like the growing um yeah there's uh, as you mentioned before there's many different methodologies to grow right of course you have the seed which seems to be the the cheapest and less uh less infrastructure wise because i mean if you're growing uh, if you're growing from either uh, clones, at least from the experience I've had, if you're growing from clones or growing from uh, somebody sends you like plugs or whatever, you have to put them, uh, or if, even if you're growing from seed, but you're growing in a greenhouse, so you can plant plugs in the field, right? You have to buy all the seeds, fill up the trays, grow them in greenhouses, monitor them daily, because uh, you don't want any of them to go bad, because, I mean, you probably put I guess I don't know. I don't know what prices are now, but they were like a dollar twenty-five not too long ago per seed. Yeah, so like, seed. if you have if you have uh, like even a hundred seeds, I mean that's expensive. If you have a thousand seeds, that's even more expensive. And if you're buying from seed, then you're you're more likely, as you said, to have males in the, or males that come up if you don't get them to the field by then. But um, in terms of that, isn't the term? Uh, is, is the same term that's applied to marijuana feminized seeds also apply to CBD? Yes. And is that essentially you have less male chromosomes in the genetics? Is that what's Correct. how it's changing? But you know, you're right. But again, it's not an absolute. And yeah. there are there are seeds that are sold 99% feminized, and they probably would be, but you won't know if they're males until a certain point. Yeah. Whereas with clones, you know already the content, what they look like, where they came from, and yeah. that they have a very, I mean, they're not saying that they can't turn also, mm -hmm. but it's the lowest ratio of turning. And in, yeah. and in my experience, we've, we've never had males. Interesting, that's good. Yeah, so isn't, isn't cloning essentially? From my point of view, that holds true. And I know that yeah. talking about Cornell, when Larry Smart came out to one of my fields and, and looked at a particular strain, he was very, very impressed. And yeah we will end up giving him samples to put it at their experimental farm up in uh, Geneva. Yeah. Which, which was amazing. Yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah, having the, the good genetics. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a matter. So I, th I think a lot of people, when they get into the industry, uh, it seems less and less that the myth is getting passed around, but there's definitely still people that see it, but hemp grows everywhere. Um, and uh, the thing I find interesting about that myth is that it, ha it has hints of truth, right? Uh, because you, you can find a, a hemp plant that grows in Brazil and you can find a hemp plant that grows in Canada, but you can't plant, you're very unlikely to get a crop if you plant a hemp cr plant from Canada and plant it in Brazil. 
uh, and, and vice versa. Um, That's exactly and, correct. That's a hundred percent correct. Yeah. And, and so like, get it. Go ahead. you know, when I said earlier on, I said, you have to get plants that are bred for your soil and your environment, which yeah. that makes a big difference. Yeah. You know, because what all you're really trying to do is increase your odds of success. You know, things happen. I mean, you could have everything perfect and wonderful, and then there could be a, you know, a freeze come over that kills all your plants. I mean, there are variables that add danger to the mix or, you know, risk to the mix. But at the end of the day, the more boxes you can check off correctly, the better chance you have of having a successful crop. And also, don't be greedy and, and overdo something you can't handle. You know, a lot of people also, they'll grow and then they forget about having a distribution chain. You know, <laughs> what do you do with all your product? Where do you get process? You know, who processes it? How do they process it? You know, absolutely. all that kind of stuff. What's, you know, and another thing with processes too, you got to be careful with them. Because what they'll do is some of them, not all, but talking about the bad actors, what they'll do is when you send them the first sample to process, you'll get a, an amazing result with a very high yield. And then when you send them a major quantity to process, all of a sudden some was lost in the, you know, in the chopping up and, and the grinding and some was lost because there were too many fats and they, you know, all of a sudden things change and they aren't what you thought and the yields aren't what you thought. And that's not fair. I mean, it has to yeah. be consistency all around and fairness all around. Like, you know, you trust certain brands of food and certain brands of oil for your car and certain cars. It's the same thing. And, you know, certain products, you never have a problem with it. And other products, you have a high, you know, rate of, you know, failure. It's the same thing in this industry. Absolutely. And again, starting out with your genetics, if, you know, if you buy, if you go to certain restaurants that sell $6 steaks, well, <laughs> you know, it's all gristle and fat. Get what you pay for. But if you go to a restaurant and encouraging you to do it, but they charge eighty dollars for a steak, that's gonna be a steak. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, same thing. Gotta be good quality. Absolutely. And especially yeah. putting the stuff in your body. And you know, why would you ingest something that you're not sure what it is and you yeah. don't trust the source? That's Absolutely. pretty great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely uh, I, I know a ton of people that I mean again this is almost kind of comes back to the aspect that the industry is a so new and then also we have to educate people on why they should be using the product i mean certainly people actually using the product is usually the best route but to get somebody to use the product it takes a little bit of education and but so many people that are jumping into the industry and maybe it's just many people just don't really understand how products work and product lines work because they they saw oh i guess you said we can plant play some hemp in the back field and we can make, become millionaires overnight. Um, they don't see totally. what that, that, yeah, exactly what that route is and how that overnight is if successful over like a three to five year span um, to really become knowledgeable on, on the whole thing. But also so many people make the product just assuming, Oh, people will buy it. Uh, and I think that's, that's really what happened with a lot of the farmers that, that came into the industry um how how some of the conversation around the industry was kind of discussed is that it seemed early on it seemed like the industry was built up a lot more than it really was and so a lot of farmers kind of jumped in thinking that they could easily sell this this product and sell the material um and they did grow many many acres and then they come to learn that they can't actually sell the material because a people want quality if they are processors because they cost them still cost them the same amount of money to process flour no matter how what percentage of, of cbd or whatever cannabinoid you're growing for is in that flour still cost the same amount of money so they're gonna they're gonna seek better quality flour and if you don't have good quality flour then that's not you're not gonna be able to sell it there and then also those people even have they actually have to know that you exist so you have to you have to reach out to them right um and i mean i know so many processors that were importing from other states not because there wasn't enough material here but just because all the material here wasn't good quality and or at least the material that was available wasn't necessarily good quality um and so uh, there's yeah there's so many people that jumped in that are now uh, kind of hurt from the industry because they they thought they were going to make all this success and they thought it was gonna be a lot easier than it was and also many farmers unless they're really successful farmers many farmers 
often don't even break even each year. And so for them to, to take up part of their land and plant something else as a test crop that may or may not work and they have to put a bunch of time and experience and energy into, uh, and then it, for it to not work out on the other end is, is sometimes even more of a challenge. Uh, and so it's um, like definitely on the note of uh, not growing too many acres all at once. I mean, uh, I talked with Mark uh, Perter and one of the things he said was like, yeah, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna start growing CBD and you've never grown anything before, plant like 100 plants. Don't even don't even go beyond that for the first year. Um, like, and don't even necessarily grow them in a field, but like just learn how to grow it, learn all the different issues that you might come across. So like other than necessarily just not growing a large amount at the very beginning and being too ambitious, what are things that people should really look out for when they're jumping into the hemp industry and like things that people might overlook? Well, you know, I think what you just said was a really, really good point and right on the money. Farmers, I mean, especially in New York, after the storms, you know, uh, Sandy and, and you know, they were, in a, they were in a lot of trouble and a lot of debt and they're hurting. And, and now that I'm hanging out with farmers, you know, before I would buy produce and think, wow, great mm -hmm. produce. I never really realized, even though I thought I might have, what a, what a farmer's life is like. Yeah. It's so hard and so difficult. Even planting onions or tomatoes or anything like that, it's so difficult. And these, these people are dedicated, and that's why it's generations and generations. And the people I even bring into work in the field, they're all happy every day, at least the farmers I've seen. Mm -hmm. They're happy, they're singing, they're very polite, you know, they're glad, and they, they respect the land. And so the farmers, in general, were looking for another, for another income stream to offset their risk, thinking that this would be it. And a lot of farmers saw other farmers that had planted the first year, let's say, in New York, having success, they wanted in on it. And so, you know, there's an old saying in Wall Street, bulls make money, bears make money, pigs get slaughtered. And so they thought, hey, I'll jump into the business, but I'll grow all this acreage. I'm a farmer. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. Not realizing. Uh, now that makes sense. <laughs> the, need, the male issue is also bugs and infestation. And one yeah. of the problems you have you know, if I have a tomato crop and I have an infestation of bugs or, you know, whatever it may be, I'm allowed to spray certain approved pesticides, insecticides, whatever you want to call them, on that plant. Those same insecticides and pesticides would work on hemp, but none of, they will be probably this year and next year approved. But as of right now, none of them are approved. So you can't even Technically, you can't do anything because yeah, technically. You, know, you go, well, hey, who's going to see me? I'll do it anyway. <laughs> but when the tester comes for the state, they test for all those things as well. And when you do your full panel, you're certainly, and you should, you should do full panels yeah. and testing all through the, the process. They're going to show up. And, you know, that, that automatically ruins your, your, the effectiveness and the, the, the viability of your crop. So you have to be careful of all of that. I just say, you know, for you as a person, a person trying to get in the business, start out the first year with, with an amount you could handle from maybe one or two sources, see which works best for you. Or even if you can, do research what will work best in your soil. Just don't go out and buy something because it says <laughs> hemp and seed. You know, try to, you know, be smart about what you do and start out slowly and expand slowly. And as far as the processors, that's true. A processor has very high costs and can only process a certain amount of volume. So if you're a processor and you've got a brain, you're going to say, well, I want to process the best quality product so I can get the best return to my client and for myself and not waste a shift on stuff that's not really that good and potentially gum up my, my machinery. So that's, that's part of it. And up until now, there was to a lot of toll processing where processors shared in the risk. You know, now farmers are looking to get their money up front. No one's really doing that. So we're kind of back to that model. And so therefore, again, as a processor, I don't want to process garbage. I want to process where we get the best return so I can pay my staff, pay my upkeep, pay my bills and keep going. And those, so from every aspect of the industry, there are benefits and there are risks and there are complications. And so being educated, being smart, and being prepared 
And it's not a one man situation. Oh yeah, if you're gonna plant 10 plants, you can do it on your own. But I mean, you need a really good team behind you and you gotta search out reputable, good people. Otherwise you're gonna find yourself in a lot of trouble and you'll yeah. waste it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And it seems like a lot of people, it, it's interesting, especially on, on the topic of um, teammates or like or, or even finding experts and consultants there's a lot of people that um either don't necessarily have any experience directly in the hemp industry but maybe have some experience in another industry and they're like jumping on board as oh i'm a cannabis consultant and i know all this stuff um and uh or or even people that are only in the hemp industry and they also call themselves the cannabis consultant but don't really know all the all the minutia of what goes into that specific uh like issue, whether it's accounting or whether it's uh, the laws or whatever it might be. Um, and, but both sides almost have, have issues, right? If somebody has never been in the hemp industry and they have expertise in, a, in another field, yeah, they definitely will probably have good things to say. Uh, but lots of times they still, have, there's so much they have to educate themselves about in the hemp industry before they can really be knowledgeable about all the different minutia that comes into play uh, because there are so many different components. Uh, and so um, it's, yeah, it's definitely difficult to kind of uh, weigh what team members might work best um, and kind of like how you, you figure out and position all those different people. Um, and, uh, and it's especially when you're growing a crop that there's, there's promise of a lot of money, um, whether or not that a lot of money can be played. And so you also have issues between uh, business partners wanting to have different cuts, different shares. Um, and so there's, uh, there's so many components at play and that's all the business stuff. And then on top of that, you have all the policy and regulation that you have to deal with. Uh, and then you have learning about this plant and finding seed and genetics. And, um, I agree with you harking on genetics. I mean, if you have good genetics, it's like having an oil well, um, and, and you're, uh, you're far more likely to be able to actually harvest from that oil well uh versus um having poor genetics and uh it definitely also seems like there's a lot of people that jumped again kind of talking about these aspects of people that are jumping into the industry not having any prior experience but saying that they're experts uh people jumping in making seed using that seed for the fir the first year right because it, it takes many years to to stabilize a crop um and so like people jumping in with like that first or second year harvest of seed, selling that at really high rates, kind of ripping people off as, as so many people, people do, or not so many people, but many bad actors do. Um, and so in terms of people looking for education on, on how they can, they can better source seed or, or some tips on, on sourcing genetics, um, what are things that people should look for in terms of like paperwork or, or just different factors like that? Well, I think just on a very general basic level, and that's a great question, I think they should read as much as they can from any source they can. Eventually, you'll see some consistency in what you're reading and you'll put together that for yourself. Yeah. You know, first of all, this is, this is like any, any industry, this isn't for everyone. But I think like the HIA is a very important source because that's one place you can go where you can trust what you're being told. You know, do I know, do I have every answer to every question about it? No, of course I don't. But you know what I do know? I know where to go if I want those answers. And I know where to go to reputable people. And just like I started out in the music business as a roadie lifting equipment, which a lot of people wouldn't admit if they did it. But you know what that taught me? That taught me that whole industry from the bottom up so that if I had a tech on the road bullshitting me, I would know he was bullshitting me because I've done it, I've been there, or I was around it. It's the same thing in this industry. I've been out, even though I didn't have to, I've been out in the fields cutting plants, planting plants, harvesting plants, in the mud, in the dirt. I had to buy muck boots. I mean, I, I did everything. In the freezing winter, I was in our warehouse, you know, counting inventory and, and, and labeling things, because I want to know every aspect of this industry so no one can pull the wool over my eyes. So that's me. But I always try to learn as much as I can. I think that's important. And I think if, if a person is going to go into this industry or open a restaurant or do anything, they should learn as much as they can. And, you know, don't spend your whole life learning so you never jump into the water. But yeah. learn as much as you can. Put a good team together. 
buy reputable products and and take a shot but yeah. do it slowly over time and incre incrementally so you do it right absolutely you know, yeah that's really important absolutely yeah no i it's, uh, i found um yeah you, you definitely don't want to get into the case of uh, analysis paralysis and uh, just over yeah. over learn yourself yeah, to death people that are like that and they just forever studying and they never jump you know yeah. they never take that yeah. shot so you don't want to do that but yeah. you want to be informed you don't want to go in blind and be blindsided either <laughs> yeah no that definitely that definitely has risk, risk everything right you yeah. still got to deal with mother nature absolutely oh yeah 100 percent. yeah the um i mean talking about people that had success the, the first year in new york that was also a pretty good year weather-wise uh, oh, and then yeah. the, then the follow-up year so people even if they had bad genetics they were far more likely to get a good crop um and and you touched on the note of like how difficult it is to be a farmer um i i was working with a, a farmer for for my crop uh and and for for growing fiber and uh the we planted the first year um in a dairy path or in a dairy field it, there was also corn growing and everything and uh um it was it was the it was so it was 2015 when we or um no 20 2016 when we planted uh, or no wait what was it 2017 when we planted sorry i'm terrible terrible with timelines no, uh, <laughs> 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 uh so um 2017 when we planted our first crop and uh it was a bit chaotic um because i had i purchased the seed um so we were growing we we're growing for uh um for fiber and uh something that i always found really interesting about that i mean it, it makes sense but uh people look at the cbd industry and it's like a dollar 25 a seed um whereas it was like uh seven dollars a pound and that's even on a high end like high level payments most of you can give like for like four bucks a pound um and uh and there's like thousands and thousands of seeds in that one pound and so it's just like the the very very big difference but we planted the first year um and it, it was that that year that was like very dry and so it had a, a very long dry period and uh, I was, I had a, a guy that mostly grew CBD, but he, he was just a knowledgeable source I could call. And um, we planted it and initially, so uh, unlike, unlike CBD where you're maybe planting on average 2,500 plants per acre, roughly you can plant different variations of that. Uh, we have like 200,000 to 400,000 plants per acre when you're growing for fiber. Um, and uh, the, initially we planted, the seed company told us to plant at 25 pounds per acre. Um, and we planted 25 pounds per acre, but then uh, it seemed to grow and it grew, the, all the plants like grew to about that big and then the dry spell hit. And then all of a sudden, like they just didn't grow anymore. And I was like, oh my God, did I just like lose all my crop? <laughs> like, this is yeah, that, that also comes down to knowing what you're doing. For yeah. instance, when we grow and, and the farmers that I've dealt with, we mm -hmm. use drip irrigation. Yeah. And drip irrigation helps because to an extent, you can control the environment. So for argument's sake, if it's, it's, if it's first of all, and your furrows have to be deep enough, but the yeah. idea would be if it's really rainy, you wanna get the water out of there, especially, I grew in the black dirt. And, <laughs> yeah. and in the black dirt, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because if it's really dry, the dirt retains moisture, but if it's really wet, it retains moisture. <laughs> so what you do is you put sheathing down with drip irrigation under it. This was the technique we use, just yeah. to give you a little idea without getting into all the secrets, just an overview. <laughs> so what the sheathing allowed was raindrops would fall into the furrows and you know not saturate the plant. And if it rained, that was enough water for the plant. But if there was a huge dry spell, excuse me, or if the plant needed certain nutrients, by going out and looking and be able to read the leaves and know what they meant by the way they looked, mm -hmm. you'd be able to feed it water or feed it nutrients yeah. as needed. And that's a big, that's a big plus. You know, it's, it's not the same as growing inside a greenhouse because the greenhouse, you take out the element of mother nature to an extent, but by the same token, you can't grow to, three, four, 500 acres in a greenhouse. At least I don't know anyone that can. At least not yet. <laughs> right, not yet. So basically that's your trade-off. You know, yeah. you grow in a controlled environment, but not a lot, which go set that up and see what that costs. 
<laughs> or you grow out on a field and try to control the environment as much yeah. as you can. And that's all you can do. Absolutely. But you got to be smart about it. So again, yeah. you think what your gross potential is, you break in your costs, and then you figure out roughly your net. And like you just yeah. said, you know, yielding. Like, you know, we, you know, also people think of an acre. You're not really growing on an acre because no. you have furrows, you have, you know, uh, yeah, roads, you know, pathways that people walk on or, or vehicles can go on. You have drainage ditches. So an acre really is, the net acre isn't really a gross acre. Yeah. It's a little less. And if you can get a pound, a pound and a half per plant. You're lucky. You <laughs> yeah, you're, you're doing, you're doing a real good job. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, definitely the aspects of uh, the, when I originally was growing with uh, CBD, we were, we were in the black dirt too. And that was, it's, it's some incredible stuff. I mean, wasn't it left behind? Wasn't there like gl glaciers involved in, in leaving that behind? It was like the riverbed or something along those lines. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, talking about the black dirt. That's true. It's a very unique area. And basically yeah. what it was, was it was a glacier that mel melted and turned into a lake and a lake yeah. drained away. So this is the lake bed. So yeah. basically what we're talking about is I think there's roughly maybe 2,000 acres, maybe, maybe more, maybe, maybe more. I might be wrong about that. But it's basically 2,000 or 10,000, whatever the number is, acres of two or three foot deep potting soil. It's amazing. <laughs> and and, and the, the, the certain hemp plants love yeah. that location. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely, it's interesting. So um, you've planted the fields, started them growing. You said that uh, since we can't spray any pesticides or anything on it, uh, except for like industrial grade vinegar. Um, yeah, organic but, kind of natural, you know, things. Yeah. That yeah. Really things. So without, if you, if you can't necessarily go too much into the, uh, uh, proprietary nature of things, but what are what are ways people can go about mitigating uh, uh, either whether it's pests or uh, weeds within the field when you're growing in, in such a circumstance? Well, you know, a good way to get rid of weeds is to take care of that before you plant. Yeah, you know, and you you can do that in, in various ways, and that depends on you know your situation. So. To say to do this or do that, it really wouldn't apply. You can't give out generic information yeah. like that. But the, the smart plan would be to get rid of your weeds and mitigate them as early on as you can. Also by using sheathing, and all this is you know not cheap, but by use, using sheathing, you eliminate the weeds because there's only a small little hole in it that the plant comes up. And you got to go, you or your team, or crew, whatever you want to call it, have to go through the fields on a regular basis. And when you see weeds coming out, especially after a rain or after, you know, you're dripping irrigation, you pull the weeds and get rid of them. So that's how you deal with weeds. The other thing to minimize bugs and all that kind of stuff, because you can't eliminate them, but you got to plant your plants far enough apart and they have to have enough air circulation so they don't get mold and they don't get fungus and they don't get all that nonsense because those are other issues. And, you know, so you try to minimize that. Yeah. And minimize the infestations, but it's hard to do. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely difficult. And uh, also touching on the aspect of, of learning, um, it, learning from books is good, but actually st jumping into the field and putting a plant in the ground and seeing how it grows is probably the best way to learn um, from people maybe getting into the industry. They may not like the $500 application fee that they have to pay, but it's pretty much pretty much as long as you're not a criminal or don't have a felony, um, you're, you're pretty clear in getting, in getting a license. Uh, so it's like, um, especially for CBD. So like for, for our fiber hemp, we just used a sickle bar to cut it down pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, but for CBD, um, not only is it like just cutting down the, the plant itself, which is a thick stock and getting into the field, but it's also uh, making sure that you don't lose flour because you want to keep that flour because it's very valuable. Um, so what are some methods that you've found uh, to kind of help, maybe not necessarily the details and specifically exactly how you're harvesting it, but um, from your perspective of the idea of like managing the whole, the whole kind of project, um, what are things that people should think about putting in place 
when it comes to uh, harvesting and, and getting that field that crop off the field and then eventually to a processor. Okay, so just just stepping back, that's a great yep. question. So one of your questions is really good, but just <laughs> stepping back for half a second, that also comes down to genetics because not not only the genetics to get you know minimum of males get the highest yielding plants, but also you want to grow a crop or a strain that has the thinnest stalks. Now you you have big stalks when you grow because your plants are yeah. very high. Yeah, ours yeah. are we get they're very low and bushy and yeah, and as thin, thin stalks, and that's how you yeah. can get your pound and a half yield per plant um, so therefore that's important as well but for argument's sake again it depends what you want to grow do you want to grow a good crop that yeah. you know to maybe sell product to a walmart or something at that level which is going to be good and quality but it's not going to be a primo yeah. super you know niche product yeah um, so therefore some people use mechanical harvesting and ultimately chop everything up, you know, buds and stalks and stems and all that kind of stuff and get a lower count to CBD, but a much higher yield in volume. There are people that aspire to that philosophy mm -hmm. or you can hand cut and hand and hand strip to get a really primo product. Going back one more time to the the inspection process. That's another beef I have with the state and that needs to be resolved. When they come out and the inspectors are really great and the way it worked, at least in our area, I think it's throughout the whole state, mm -hmm. depending on the size of your field, they take five or 10 samples and they come out and they do basically a W pattern. So they don't just cut from one plant, they take a sample of plants. And there again also, if you're growing from clones, all your plants are really the same, except maybe the ones that are on the edges mm -hmm. of the field because of various reasons, agricultural reasons. Um, but they'll take the top cuttings. Yeah. And all that's representative. That's also the richest, the highest content. Whereas there'll be buds that are down lower that are just as beautiful and just as big, but will be slightly different. So for my money, I wish when they tested a field, they cut from different parts of the plant. I think yeah. that would make that would be more representative of yeah. what you're going to get when we actually harvest and go for a yield. Yeah. So I wish they would change that. But I yeah. think again, it depends. If you have 500 acres, I mean, you get better have a, you better have an army. You better bring in a national <laughs> army that and to hand harvest that. Whereas you know, if you have a smaller amount that's manageable, you can do that. Yeah. And so therefore, again, it's, it, you got to come up with an equation or a formula or a plan that works for you. And it all comes down to how much are you growing? What are you growing? And what's your, what are your goals? And what, yeah. what's your budget? Because, you know, you might be able to spend lots of money because you have it or you have investors, but I'm a little mom and pop thing and it's just me and my two kids, you know, and we have to do everything ourselves. And that's what's great about this business, though. There's room for everybody. Absolutely. But I just know if, if I was going to get into the farming aspect of it, because I, I partner with farmers that are experts, that's about bringing in the right team, or I'll consult with people that you know, need that advice and help. I think if I was going to do this, I would, I would try to do something that I could handle at my level with enough resources in case things went bad so I can right the ship if necessary. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It, it is, as long as you uh, are willing to put in the work and the time and the effort, it, it, it's an industry that anybody can get into. Um, and, uh, and in terms of uh, farm, like, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'd say after my experience with working with farmers, um, I can't say I'd want to be a farmer. Uh, I definitely love working with them. They're probably the most humble people I've ever met uh, mm -hmm. because they do they put all that effort in and they are so passionate about it. Um, but it, it is, it's, it's, it's grueling work. Um, but in terms of, uh, and on that subject, in terms of harvesting, so hand harvesting, uh, I don't know if these are just oversized numbers or if they're actually like a rough estimate, but uh, I've heard from people that were hand harvesting that if they had like, 20 to 30 people working 16 hour days, they were lucky if they got a few acres off the, off the field uh, in, a, in a day. Um, 
and uh and there's like that's that's a lot of people right i mean unless you're a massive farm you're unlikely to have 30, 30 people on staff that are able to come into that operation and immediately work um so like even just sourcing those people is challenging um what what have you seen in terms of like hand harvesting like how, how much how much of an effort does that take uh and then after that uh is there a way to mechanically harvest or do you see somebody down the horizon a way to mechanically harvest without getting all the stocks and everything? Um, like, is there, a, is there a middle, middle way between the hand harvesting and, and full mechanical? Yeah. Well, I think also, you know, there's equipment being designed and built now that will eliminate that problem. So in a year or two, we'll be able to mechanically harvest without losing everything and we'll get there at some point. Yeah. But I think one of the keys also, especially if you have large acreage, is if you plan everything at once and it's all going to mature at once, then you have a problem <laughs> because you need an army to do what you're saying, the hand yeah. harvest. But if you have different strains, excuse me, and they, they mature at different points and you stagger your harvesting, yeah, it's a lot of effort, but you don't, you don't have to worry about doing 100 acres in one day yeah. because the plants are going to die. So you've got to stagger your crop. But any any good farmer would know that anyway, and then or then maybe the the answer is you know if you want to you want to enter your crop into both ends of the market, you hand harvest some, you mechanical harvest other, mm -hmm. so that you have a mix that works for you. Absolutely. But the idea is to never put put your back against the wall, so you can't harvest this yeah. your your product at the maximum time. That would be really foolish. Yeah, absolutely. But again, if you don't study and you don't understand the math of the business you're going to do that. And I've seen it done, you know, just yeah. like the guys that planted on a mountainside, a Rocky mountainside and come harvest on the plants are that big. <laughs> they're wondering what went wrong. And that's funny, but it's not funny for them. Yeah, no, it's I not. For yeah. them. But you know, think, you know, yeah. you know what, you know, I think one of the problems too is everyone goes, Oh, well, cannabis is a weed. It grows everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it, it does, <laughs> but it doesn't yield what you want just because no. it grows everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, you're 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 going to get a plant, but yeah, you're uh, you're not going to get not a good what plant. You want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is true. Yeah, no, there's there's just so many uh, components to this that it's like what really got me into the hemp industry originally was um, I thought I thought I was going to go into marijuana, and then I looked at marijuana and I was like, well, technically marijuana is just THC at this point in time. I'm sure there will be other cannabinoids added to it later down the road, but uh, whereas hemp has I can I can talk to so many different people. I can talk to construction workers. I can talk to pharmaceutical people. I can talk to farmers. There's just such a a swath of people that I, I can I can communicate with, and I can learn from. Right? Because as you said, learn, learning is uh, learning is fun. Um, at least for me. Maybe I'm just really biased. But uh, um, no, it's, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> learning is fun, and it keeps you, it keeps you current and vibrant. Yeah. You know, otherwise, you get locked into one mindset, and you never grow. You just stay in one place. Yeah absolutely yeah no it's it's definitely yeah and this industry just has so so much we need to learn and so much that there isn't even available to learn yet because we need to do a bunch of research to really find it out and so you have so many different avenues and opportunities that people can can seek out um but it's also really challenging because there's just there's so many opportunities right you don't want to have uh, too many choices um so it can be it can be challenging uh and so um kind of to step out away from the aspect of uh, farming and, and even maybe necessarily product creation, but how do you, we, we talked about like, how do you kind of talk with a, a consumer and, and get them to be educated to just use CBD or whatever in the first place, but how do you go about um, like either creating a brand or managing a brand and keeping um, like getting, trying, because there are so many people getting into the industry to try to keep uh, yourself uh, differentiated in the market and and actually uh, stand out to some degree, right? Because I mean, somebody goes into a gas station and there's 10 different CBD bottles. They go into another gas station, there's 10 completely different CBD bottles than there was even in, in the other place. Um, and so it's it's hard to stand out and then consumers end up getting confused and they don't, they also don't necessarily know what the different qualities they want to be looking for. So I guess on, on two levels, um, what are what are ways that people can can get their brand to stand out, and uh, and also what are ways that that brand can then help consumers 
to understand what's good and then also how consume how can consumers look out to like see what is good quality and kind of understand what they're reading and that's a lot but <laughs> no, no, that's a good question also you're full of good questions today <laughs> but I, I think one thing that's important is you know once people try it and it, and it works for them they tend to tell their friends yeah so that's kind of like a grassroots way of where knowledge about CBD and the fact that it works uh, means something. Because if a stranger came up to me and said, hey, you want to buy this for 60 bucks, this is great. I'm going to be skeptical. But if my neighbor or my friend that I know for 20 years says to me, wow, man, I, you know, my back hurts and I tried this, it really works. And it's not addictive. It's not an opioid. It's purely natural and there are no side effects. Hey, you know, I would try it. So yeah. there's that like undercurrent that's going on. How does that help your brand? It doesn't. It just helps CBD in general. But you said you said the key word. How to differentiate yourself from everybody else and stand away from the pack is the crucial to any the crucial component to any type of marketing. So you have to have a great product. It has to really look good taste good, feel good, you know, have all those touchy feely things that are necessary. And it takes a lot of effort to market. And again, you know, a lot of my experience from the record industry uh, taught me some really, because that was where guerrilla marketing was invented, <laughs> real guerrilla marketing. You know, an example is if you had a band that you were trying to get a record deal for, and they were playing a club that night, and you had the record company come down to see them in a real club situation. Well, and I'm, you know, you would have 10 or 20 people, girls, boys, whatever, standing around those record company people, yelling and screaming and saying how great the band is. And, <laughs> and they were fans, but maybe they wouldn't be that over, you know, zealous, but they were Absolutely. because we asked them to. And the record company would go, oh, we got to sign them before someone else does. So it was like the fear of missing out. So kind of what you got to do is wherever you are, especially if you're a small business, if you're a big business, well, then you could, you know, have distribution and all that kind of stuff. And that helps. And, it, and you know, distribution is a generic term. It depends what your terms are for that distribution. Because wherever you want to be, shelf space is crucial. And, you know, grocery stores, bodegas, whatever, people will give you a shot. But when they see it's not selling, you're gone because they, they need shelf space for products that sell because that's how they make their money. But, you know, what a small person could do is if you're growing, I don't know, I'm picking out something. If you're growing and, you, and your, your operation is in Queens, New York, for instance, the borough of Queens, New York, then you have to go to try to sell and get distribution in that area and get in articles and reputation and eventually spiral out from that. And if you have a friend who's in California that'll take your product and do the same thing, well, then you spiral out and you spiral out from these different areas mm -hmm. until you reach critical mass. That's, and you know, and there's, it's different for everybody, but that's basically a way to do it if you're a small company. If you're a big company and you have lots of money, well, you partner, you do whatever you need to do. Can I give you an actual marketing plan? I'm not, I wouldn't do that because I don't know your individual situation. I would have to study it and analyze it and come up with mm -hmm. one. But one thing is to be creative, to be honest, and to be just, you know, tenacious about doing it. Yeah. You know, everybody thinks today social media is the answer. But, you know, just pr printing a picture of your bottle and saying, wow, this is really great. Try it. Everybody's doing that. Yeah. So you know, it's the difference between you, me, him, and everybody. you got to find other ways to do that. Or even if you're going to be on social media, other ways to, you know, showcase your product that's not like everyone else is doing. Yeah. Because I could show you right now 10 products that are all doing the same thing and all getting the same result, which is very little. Because they're splitting the pool of potential customers. So, you know, I think no one that I'm aware of right now is doing really great marketing, is being yeah. very creative and accomplishing the goal. Absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that. And it almost, I, I agree with the, the note on social media, because um, while it is a big field where lots of people and lots of eyes are, it's also highly competitive to be in there. And, and if you do want to think about marketing it 
it's not cheap to market it. <laughs> like it costs a lot of money to to put up ads, uh, and so it's it almost seems, um, particularly in in the sense, as you said, for a small business, it almost seems like uh, um, while the internet may used to have been like the the small place where you could like try to get new advertisement and new venues, um, going like actually building a community around her, your product and actually uh, talking to the people that are right next door to your product because um, as you said uh, like um, ground roots word of mouth is one of the best ways to sell a product uh, I don't know I don't know how big of a fan you are of, uh, of Tesla but like th they sell their ent all of their products like entirely from word of mouth right I mean definitely you have lots of youtubers but those people are, are essentially word of mouth they're not being paid by Tesla to, to do it they don't even have a marketing thing they 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 just build, they make a really great product. Uh, they focus on the authenticity of that product, right? Because there's also a note that a lot of people, they try to bring in kind of marketing to try to get their, their product to become really famous and all this kind of stuff, but they don't necessarily have any backing that can really back them up once that, that disappears, right? They don't really have a great product that, that can really hold its ground and, and actually uh, be something that consumers want. So they have to keep spending ad dollars. And after a while, they're gonna they're just gonna run themselves spending ad dollars, and they're not really gonna have uh, they're gonna have a very um, what's the word uh, a cost of cost of customer or cost to acquire customer um, to uh, they're gonna have, it's gonna be incredibly high because they're gonna they're not gonna have something to stand on the ground. So, uh, and in essence, it's almost better to make a really great product before you even think about uh, trying to. I mean, it's kind of chicken and egg problem. You want to build a brand, but you also want to have a good product that can back up that brand. Um, and, uh, yeah, differentiating yourself in the CBD market is just, it's, it's crazy. Cause I mean, everybody's like, oh, this product will deal with inflammation and it'll make you feel better and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, uh, everybody has the best product doing the same thing. <clears throat> yeah. I think well, there's a thing called eye fatigue with social media. <laughs> You're getting hit so many ways by so many different products. Like even if you just go on the internet, you know, you get pop-ups, you get this, you get the, you know, you get all these different apps and things to prevent that. I mean, people are just getting tired of that. Yeah. And, you know, again, the other thing is, you know, going back to my soda analogy from before, there's not one hemp business in America that is at the level of a Coke or Pepsi <laughs> that, can, that can handle that amount of marketing that could become a household name when you just look at the logo and you know what it is. Yeah. I mean, that takes a long time to get to that point. And so therefore you got to start out small and branch out. And, you know, and if your local area supports you, then that's a good start. I, I will give away one hint. <laughs> and one hint is the way to get free advertising is go to your local newspaper, your local radio station, whatever, and with a story. That's yeah. compelling. So they go, wow, my listeners would want to hear about this and try to get an article in the paper, try to get, you know, a little time on a radio station being interviewed so that people see you that way. That's called news and you don't have to pay to be a news, you know, be newsworthy. So that's really free advertising. And then you yeah. say some good things and things that are important, but of course you also mention your product. Mm -hmm. And so people know about you. So that's one thing I think not enough people are trying to do. Yeah. And newspapers don't know who to go to. So they go to the same people over and over again, which yeah. is fine. You know, I've been in interviews a lot of times all over the country because people heard about me, not because I'm, I'm so special. And for me and my own, like, let's say my own business and my own awareness in the marketplace, I prefer to do that organically because mm -hmm. I, I'm not a heavy handed, high pressure salesman. Yeah. But if I had, if you, you know, if, if you have product that you want to sell, you got to find a way to differentiate yourself and get out there before you're sitting on product forever and it just doesn't go. And you, yeah. your labeling and everything has to be really nice and catch eye catchy. But Absolutely. it also has to say the truth, you know, what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a company that was just, you know, cited by the FDA for saying their products are good to cure cancer. I mean, don't say dumb things like that. Oh, I mean, maybe yeah. they are. But that hasn't been proven, oh, exactly. and it's not for you to say. Exactly. You know, they may, you know, and and you know, just because it worked on my shoulder or your back or took away her anxiety, that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. everybody. So don't don't. The one thing you don't want to do in business is make a statement that you have to walk back. Yeah. So be a little more conservative with your statements, but just you know, think of unique ways to get name recognition and out there. Maybe give away yeah. some product.
I mean, whatever it takes. You know how Absolutely. Nike became so big? You know wow. the story of Nike? I'll tell you two quick advertising <laughs> stories. It just shows you about creativity. Yeah, Nike became really big because what they did was they realized, you know, they were going to do a basketball thing. So what they did was they went into all the ghettos, a lot of ghettos in New York, Chicago, and elsewhere, and they gave away free shoes to the kids playing basketball. And therefore, they got recognized and known. And every kid, you know, younger kid, went, Mom, I want those. We got to get those. And then the basketball players got involved. And they're getting royalties on every shoe they sell, you know. So, I mean, which is okay. That's part of it. Yeah, but, absolutely. you know, again, that's how they distinguish themselves. Even though it's not a, a great product right now and it has issues with what's in it. Years and years ago, the, the advertising team and the marketing team around Johnson's baby powder sat around and said, well, how can we, you know, increase our profits on this product? So, you know, someone said, well, we can, you know, put less into it and charge the same amount. Yeah, we can do that, but we don't want to really rip off our customers. Well, we can, you know, we can put more in it and charge more. Yeah, but, you know, we don't need to do that as well. And then one guy said, well, we can make the holes bigger on the can you know, on the packaging. So when they, they shook it out, more came out and we went through it faster. And they went, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And that's how they increased their profits because people went through the product faster because it came out so fast. Yeah. It was, you're wow. not going to put it back in the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Those are creative things. Or even Apple. When Apple yeah. first started out, they gave out, I don't know how many computers to schools. Yep. So all the kids that were starting to, you know, learn on computers were learning on Apple computers. When it was time to buy a computer, what did they think of buying? Yep. Those are like, you know, different levels of different ways to be creative. Yep. And Absolutely. even though they're, you know, high level advertising marketing companies, that just shows you even at that level, creativity stands out. And you yep. got to be creative. Think about a way to distinguish yourself. I think that's Absolutely. important. Absolutely. And, and, and kind of on that note, it's, it's a, um, I think a, a lot of, I mean, it brings very much, for the, the whole industry, but a lot of people want short-term gains. Um, but your short-term gains are very, very unlikely to uh, bring long-term success. Um, so you can you could spend a million dollars on advertising, but if you can't keep spending those million dollars, then it's not really going to go anywhere. Um, whereas, like uh, using a more creative avenue, like what Nike did or Apple or or uh, um, Johnson Johnson, uh, the it's it's a lot more creative, but it takes a little bit more time, right? But but that organic growth is what uh, allows people to be sustainable because, um, as you said, like the the reason we would want to buy those products is because we see other people we know wearing them, or we see people that we look up to wearing them, uh, and so that becomes part of that person's identity to an extent in terms of like how we view them, uh, and so therefore we we would want to to have them ourselves, um, and so. Yeah, I definitely, I, I agree on the note of, uh, of community-based advertising, local advertising, or even just going into, uh, because also that, that, that helps if somebody were to come back and like ask about that company in the local community, you want your local community to be speaking well of you. Uh, you don't want to have, um, you don't want to have like any, any, uh, go ahead. And the key word here also, sorry to interrupt, the key word here also is trust. You want to yeah. build trust trust in the in the marketplace in the community so that people go well this is a brand i can trust this is a brand i can rely on i'm going to stick with it because that's yeah. what you want to you don't want just a one-hit wonder they try yeah. your product oh, that was great and then they move on. <laughs> you want yeah. you want stickiness and you want people to stick to your product and that's that's involved and and the problem in the hemp space is you know again education but there's so many companies inundating you with we're the best we're organic with you know all these kind of buzzwords and they're all using all the right terms and words yeah. it's just they're all it There's becomes so just many. a herd you yeah. know a herd mentality is that they're all the same pick one you know yeah it's hard absolutely yeah no it, it is it is really challenging how to differentiate yourself and uh especially for brands um yeah no it uh yeah it's uh, now when you were on, on the road, were you would you like essentially be managing the people's brands as well in terms of like their publicity and all that kind of stuff, or was somebody else usually taking care of that? Well, you know, just like I was talking before about a team, you it yeah. depends on what level the band was at, but you would have a team, 
So yeah, yeah you would have to, you would, you know, and I would coordinate everyone's time. So again, like everyone thinks, oh wow, it's really romantic. But <laughs> during the day, if you're not traveling, you're doing interviews for the next show or the two shows before that, or a magazine article that'll come out in six months or another country, because that's where you're gonna to tour next. So you'd have your press people that would set all these things up and you'd have to coordinate it. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing was you would have to, you know, logistically coordinate radio interviews. You know, they're gonna call the radio station for tonight's show, the newspaper for tonight's show, all those kind of things. But you had your team, you know, a, I call it a division head, but it, they were in charge of that area and I would coordinate all of that because it would have to filter through a command central or mission control. Yeah. And I was control. So it went yeah. whoever it was, whatever it was, went through me and then I would motivate the band to do what I needed. And I'll give you an example about knowing your market. Just a quick story. Mm -hmm. Um Billy Idol was a client of mine at one point. And when I got involved with Billy Idol, I wasn't managing him, I worked for him. Mm -hmm. And his manager was the same person that was managing KISS at the time. Um, so anyway, Billy Ida wanted me to get involved with him, and I did. And when I got involved with him, the, I had a meeting with the publicist, who's a brilliant publicist, and she said to me, you know, Billy just doesn't show up for interviews, and he won't do any interviews, and I don't know what to do. Well, Billy Ida was a night person, and it turned out that this uh... publicist was doing all his interviews at eight and 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he was not going to show up, not because he didn't care and value, but yeah. that was his lifestyle. So I said, you know what, let's start having dinner interviews. And we started having interviews at eight, nine o'clock at night. And you know that Billy showed up for every interview and they went <laughs> great. And his personality came out and it was amazing. And so it's that kind of thing. It's knowing yeah. what Dealing with and how to deal with it. So, in answer to your question, yeah, I was like Command Central when I was on the road, and then when I was managing, I I had other people doing that for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, um, finding finding those those differences, right? Even though even though something is maybe the standard, um, like as you said, people interviewing during the day, uh, they're uh, finding some sort of niche or differentiator in that in that same path. Uh, allows you to, to stand out and allows you to get things done that maybe somebody else wasn't able to find a, a way to get it done. Um, so uh, it's, the, yeah, there's just so many different complexities to it. So I know we've, we've covered a whole bunch of, whole bunch of things, but uh, if, if you were to say to somebody that was looking at getting into the hemp industry that doesn't really know, like they, they maybe know they want to, We'll, we'll just target the cannabinoid industry. Um, they want to be in the cannabinoid industry. Uh, what is a good, like other than just broad educate yourself, what is a good way to kind of start getting into that? Like, are there, are there jobs out there that people could get? Like you could be a roadie, for example, in, in, in state, uh, in, in music production. Um, or are there uh, like, like, as you said, maybe people planting a few plants or maybe um, working for a process. Like what are, what are things that people could look at to like, they have no, no idea anything about the industry other than they could potentially make money and there's opportunities. What are some tips? So we were focusing on people that wanted to start their own business yeah. and you know, we're ready to you know, invest money, plant, do this, do that. But if you're talking about people that want to enter the industry at different levels, you know, you, try to find a company and try to get an internship at the, at the very lowest level. Try to get an internship with a company, put in the time, watch how things operate. Or there may be, again, right now it's a little difficult because of the virus, but there may be companies that are hiring certain positions, whether it be a stock boy or you know an assistant to the assistant or whatever it may be, or a salesperson, I mean, go approach companies, you know, get a resume together, you know, have your, your, you know, have the way you sell yourself and the way you explain who you are, have you that thought out and go try to get those opportunities. You, you know, in life, you have to create your own opportunities. Sometimes I'm not going to come to you event. You know, what's not fair is eventually when you're successful, everything comes to you, but in order to get there, you have to do a lot of work to get there and then you have yeah. to create opportunities meet people, network, go to events. You know, there are enough expos and forums and different things. Yeah, you got to pay a few bucks to get in, whatever. But do that, you know. It's worth it. Join yeah. an organization like a New York HIA so that Absolutely. you can learn about it. 
and you can network with other people. And I think as the HIA, New York HIA expands, they'll have more opportunities for people and maybe they, some of them will be unemployment or employment opportunities. I think that's important. You know, in the meantime, from my point of view, I mean, I know in the music business, I would get tapes or CDs, hundreds of them every week. Excuse me for one second. I'm dry. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, I was very respectful. I, I actually listened to everyone and got back to everyone. And even if someone's music was horrible, I would tell them, you know, listen, I don't hear a, a career launching single or something that would make a record company want to hire you, but keep writing, keep at it. Yeah. You never know. I would never take away someone's desire to do something. Uh, by the same token, I wouldn't encourage someone that was totally not fit for certain thing to do that either. Cool. But you know, you got to inspire people to try, because the more people again that understand that are better at what they do, the better it is for all of us. Nice. And you know, and that's one of the reasons why I branched out and started my own firm, is because I could help others and you know help other people navigate the waters that I've already navigated. Absolutely. And, yes. A lot, a lot of rivers to navigate still, and a lot of places that we haven't uh, haven't discovered. Yeah, so I mean that that's kind of my advice, yeah, and I would absolutely. say if people, you know, people wanted to reach out for me or to me, um, yep. you can reach me at, at my email address, which is the Suet Group. That's S E W I T T, the Suet Group at Gmail, awesome. and it's, the Suet Group is all one word. And you know, I would have a conversation with someone, whether yeah. I would be involved with everybody I you know obviously you, know, <laughs> you only have so much I, time you know, to have at least a short conversation with someone that's legitimate yeah. to try to help them you know, maybe take that one step forward absolutely cool well thank you very much for joining me George it's it's a pleasure um, and uh, you're incredibly knowledgeable not just about the hemp industry but uh, about uh, I mean the music industry specifically but it, it brings so much um, experience in so many different avenues because not only are you just dealing with the music itself but you're dealing with the lighting you're dealing with transportation you're dealing with coordinating so many different components um, so yeah so it, it's, it's a pleasure to, to talk with you and uh, I, I look forward to working with you more in the future and, and uh, working on the NYHIA and uh, we're going to make this industry become great so I believe so. And I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to chat with you today. Uh, you know, you're a good guy. You're one of the good guys. And uh, this just helps. It helps everybody. So it's, it's great. Thank you so, so much. Cool. Yeah, great awesome. day. Thank you. Enjoy the sunshine. Yeah, you too. Enjoy, enjoy your day. Thank you very much for joining us here on What Can I Radio. If you enjoyed what you heard and you'd like to hear more, please consider smashing that like button below and subscribing to our channel so you can be the first to know when we release new content. If you enjoyed the video so much that you'd like to watch another right this moment, check out our video right here. Or if you'd like to see what YouTube is offering to you, check out the videos over here or down below. Thank you very much for joining us and have yourselves a wonderful day.